it's time to start another thorn. The first reader tonight is Denise Dean. Those who can't listen without talking should go somewhere else. Thank you. I'm going to read you some stuff from a book of mine called Salkins, which is Gaelic for soul. Um, Pittsburgh broke me in. The sidewalk was always cracked. I was falling constantly, pulling cinder blocks out of my knees. I'd run down hills and fall and roll until I was dizzy at the bottom and lay there and look at the cotton candy clouds crawling across the sky. My pants were grass stained, the knees already ripped out, my nails full of dirt. I liked the way the ground felt under my body, the way it had curves that outlined mine. I felt full when my face touched the moistness under the tree at the bottom of the hill, the hollow space under it just right for resting your face next to. I stared up into the sky knowing I could find my way back here from no matter where I was. The orange color of it was as familiar to me as my mother's eyes and burned into me as painfully. Thinking of my Aunt Marion, whose breakdowns were her children, she talked about them with the same mixture of sorrow and pride in her voice that my mother had talking about me. Something in my heart broke when she talked about them, but each time something stronger replaced it until the pain wasn't as strong as she was and I envied her. Aunt Marion let three stray cats interbreed and mate over and over and over again until 30-some cats ran wild over her house. They climbed up the curtains and jumped down onto the supper table until you could no longer sit there to eat. We had to sit on the couch that reeked of pee with TV tables on our laps and try to balance them while a cat decided to use our legs as a scratching post. Think of it as an adventure, my dad would say before we got in the car to go over. My mother, brother, and sister eventually all stopped going until it was just my dad and me pretending not to notice the stench. The last straw was when they ripped the family Bible to shreds. There was no other record of where anyone had come from, and their memories differed wildly, so I never could get one answer. My aunt called the exterminator. I had never thought of one in terms of cats, and was kind of surprised when they showed up in big insulated suits and hoods carrying bags. I didn't watch, just saw them coming out afterwards with ten bags full of cats. Jesus, my dad said, there must have been many more than we first thought. That's her problem, he said. Her heart has too much room in it. She doesn't know where to stop with her kindness, and that can be just as bad as never starting, he said. Ah, oh, do you really believe that, I asked him. My dad's aunt Katie was very superstitious. He has pictures of himself little dressed up in girls' clothing. I always thought they were hand-me-downs, but the more I read, the more I was convinced she dressed them that way so the fairies wouldn't take them. Sometimes I thought they did, and that this person who was supposed to be my dad was a replacement, and that was why he slept so much and had so many stories. I didn't know enough then to know if there was a mark that would tell me if it was really him, but I counted the moles on his back almost every day. I asked my dad constantly, how do you know you're still alive? I don't, he said. Hmm, I said, staring at him and counting his moles over again. My friend Patty had a port wine stain across her armpit. A birthmark that showed just a little bit until she took off her shirt and showed it to me. Some people have them across their face, she said. Mine's almost a secret. Some people said it was the mark of the devil the day we mixed up hand lotion, perfume, pee, and I'm not sure what else with a popsicle stick. <laughs> we had the mixture in a dirt hole dug in her backyard to make motion potion so we could go really fast or really slow depending on who we had to spy on that day and what secrets we wanted to find out. We ended up in the hospital getting our stomachs pumped out afterwards. <laughs> afterwards, both of our mothers bought us dresses, which they said was to help with forgetting the pain of it all, but I thought it was to keep us from ever trying anything like that again. You probably wouldn't try such things in a dress. That's why my dad's aunt thought he'd be safe in one. <laughs> We thought the whole led to fairies, and if we could find one and we could not look away like they always try to trick you into doing, we could move at any speed we wanted to for the rest of our lives. 
My Aunt Stella used to go to funeral parlors and do dead ladies' hair, who a week or two earlier she had been shampooing in her sink in her basement on her days off. <laughs> her fingers were always pruned, the tips very white, bleached out so they scared me if I saw them first. They looked like the fingers clutching the chair leaning backwards into her sink, scared the water would sting their faces or get into their eyes. When it did, they flailed their arms around wildly, screaming, A towel! Jesus, give me a towel! She'd take her time, and I could see terror pass over their faces. Going backwards into water was like going to the prison camp showers, trusting someone else to take care of your head, one told me once. And she screamed louder than anyone with soap in her eyes. My aunt would pat her hand and head until she calmed down. Then she'd dry them and put them under huge silver dryers, and then scream when they talked to the person in the next chair. Some would fling up the top and say, it's too hot, I can't breathe, it's too hot, I'm suffocating, turn it down. Sometimes I felt like I was trapped in that basement and would never get out. The smell of old age, bodies, and mildew. The room with the cans topped with dust all lined up on the shelves. Hairspray and dye and perfume only made it worse. I'd run up to the top of the steps to the screen door, and outside it would still be all green. The sun was hid in the ivy growing on the house. Their skin was covered with brown spots like the one on their hands, hid under layers of powder clinging to the folds of the wrinkles set deep and circling a mouth that usually looked ready to cry. They'd leave happy pressing 50 cents into the palm of my aunt who was hoping for more but would manage to smile and say, you look good, Stada Baba. And they would smile looking into the mirror she held up, seeing themselves miraculously transformed. I'd try as hard as I did when Miss Jan looked into the magic mirror and saw all those little kids watching TV, but she never saw me in her mirror. And I'd stare over their shoulders into their faces reflected, imagining them at church pulking with legs that matched the faces they saw, forgetting the support shoes and varicose veins. The legs that stood by sinks are in fields, sturdy and strong. Kids dropped out from behind them, dancing with joy. I remember my grandmother used to love when Stella would come over and fix her here. Her eyes would glow when Stella said, You're beautiful, Mom. Look in the mirror. She'd peek in timid, then look a little longer and say, Fine. Then Stella would get my grandpa and he'd say something about all that fussing being a waste of time and what was that pain anyhow. She didn't need it. Her cheeks were pink enough from cooking over a stove. Oh, Dad, Stella would say. She looks beautiful. He'd kind of grunt and give her a hug and leave the room. My grandmother would remind me of a girl getting ready for a prom and feeling let down by a look in her date's eyes. And I would feel a little embarrassed for her and pretend I didn't notice or say, I think you're beautiful, Grandma, you are to me. But it wasn't enough and she'd wipe off her face on the apron and put her combs back into her hair, ruining the set in my aunt's day off. Stella would sit in the kitchen trying to coax my grandma into doing her hair. Grandma would look helpless and trapped under the cape, like my brother David did in a high chair with scissors coming at his head like wild birds trying to peck his eyes out, or me having knots combed out of my hair. But we all knew it was best just to go along. It would hurt less if you didn't fight. You'd look worse later, but just sit still. My grandmother would cheer up for a while at her reflection with a halo of waved hair around her face, which looked softened and a bit younger, but she wasn't. And then my grandfather was dead, and she stopped letting my aunt touch her, caring less than she loved than ever. I didn't see her fixed up again until the funeral home, laying in a white silk nightgown all made up like a weird bride. And her bridesmaids were all there standing around ready to be next. Doesn't she look lovely, they were all saying, so natural looking, with her face a funny shade of orange, layers of pancake makeup covering her skin. Only her hands laying over the blanket holding her rosary still looked the same, so I picked one up and kissed it. It was all cold like the cold hands of the woman in the damp basement, scared to death of the dark that comes with water in their eyes. I look at her hand. It looks very old, very worn, many lines in her palm and wrinkles in her arm, like the pimply skin of a naked chicken. The ladies stand around and they're patting me with their cold old dead hands. I want to scream, stop, it's giving me the creeps. You're all dying, can't you see that you're dying? My Aunt Stella comes over and grabs my hand, pulls me outside and looks at me. I think for a moment she's going to slap me in the face because I've held up a mirror to their faces. But this is the woman who goes alone into rooms with dead people that sometimes spring up for a second.
springing up like one of the old ladies with soap in their eyes, scared that they're dead when they can't see. She lays them back down and combs their hair, soothing them. Her calm voice and strong hands let them relax. My mother had never been one to hug us. You showed her how much you loved her by how hard you could work and how well you could take care of yourself. So I grew nails and walked around for most of my teenage years unable to really touch anyone and incapable of saying I love you. My mother was going into the hospital to have her gallstones taken out. She was terrified, I could tell by the way her voice sounded. She didn't say it, but I could tell in the way she was walking slowly up and down the stairs and the clink of every dish washed, rinsed, and put in the dish rack. I sat there wanting someone else to mention it. They all kept moving up and down, up and down. My dad was terrified of this person who had helped him when he had his nervous breakdowns breaking down herself. She came downstairs with her suitcase unused for 20 years. She sat on the couch resigned to whatever happened, head to the side and shoulders rigid. I was running out of time. I could say something now or lose the chance. Maybe even have her die before I'd ever get to thank her. I went over and sat next to her on the couch. She pulled away a little, but leaned towards me with her head like a child who wants to be hugged, but is scared the other kids will laugh if they see. I reached over and brushed something off her dress. I was still scared to name what was going on. All these words ran through my head. All this tenderness was stuck in my throat. We sat there in silence. I heard our car coming up the street. My dad had brought it around from the garage. Soon he'd be honking. I took her hand, which was large, the skin tough from bleach and detergent. I held it next to my cheek, the scent under my nose. I love you is all I managed to say. I know, she said, looking me right in the eye. I needed to cry, but I didn't think I should. This was my one chance to be strong for her, the one time I had ever seen her need anything. I helped her carry the suitcase to the car. My dad was already fiddling with the gear shift. It will be fine, I said. I'll come visit. A little of her toughness had already come back. She nodded at me brusquely and rolled up the window. I went inside and cried.